Beowulf, Age of Heroes. Hello, it's John Hodgson again from Handiwork Games, co-creator of uh, Beowulf Age of Heroes, and we are back with episode three. In this show, we are going to discuss the rule summary section that appears at the end. Is it the beginning? No, the end of the setting chapter. It's worth checking out our other previous episodes if you haven't already. Uh, and we are working our way through the 272 pages of Beowulf Age of Heroes out now in PDF at Drive Through RPG and available for pre order at www.handywork.games. Check it out. Hopefully, it is well worth your time. I'm joined on this episode, apart from the tremendous construction noise you might be able to hear, I'm joined by Jacob Rogers. You should follow Jacob on Twitter. He's at Jacob Rogers RPG. Very clever chap, Jacob. So always a delight to work with him. Anyway, on with the show. Beowulf, Age of Heroes. So, um, the game of Beowulf. I could just read this section. Beowulf is sent <laughs> around the hero oh, class. <laughs> come on. Created specifically for this setting. And it is. So we have created. The hero class right. for five E. Yep. Now, it ha and and this is about positioning your character in the world very specifically. In Beowulf: Age of Heroes, you do play a hero. I'm sorry if you wanted to play like a woodcutter or something like that. You'll have to find a different game. You're a hero in this, and there are six subclasses which we've created. Each one, I still think this is very clever or very stupid. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's clever. Yeah. Each subclass is centered around an ability score, which is, I just think that's great. Yep. It was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> was it? I don't I know think it was. was. I don't know, David might need to know. deserve a little credit there. Yeah, oh yeah, poor David, he might have come up with all of this. <laughs> we'll just we'll just say we did it. Um, sorry, David. Uh, so yeah, and so the hero class, yeah, six subclasses, so you know, do your ability scores, if you don't know what those are, you know, strength, dexterity, constitution, all that. And that just sort of sets a theme for your hero. We'll come to more of that later um uh, we have no so-called races in beowulf everyone is assumed to be a human being um just that fits the setting better um than anything else so there is no you in character creation you don't have stuff from your race in inverted commas you can't see me doing air quotes <laughs> um they're, they're all folded into your background during character creation so you don't need to do that bit um, yeah, cool. Hero class, very good. Excellent. I think it's nice. I think it sets the, Excellent. Sets the tone. Excellent. All right. Uh, like we talked about a little bit uh, in the previous uh, section, uh, alignment uh, has to do with your interface to the world, uh, whether you're aligned with the old gods, the new church, uh, or neutral. Uh, we always assume that everybody, like John said, is a hero. You're, always, you're out there fighting monsters. Now, your personal motivations may be a little different depending on uh, what you want to focus on there, um, but the alignment has to do with your position in the social structures that you're going to find within the stories. So a hero can walk into a particular meat hall and they happen to be aligned with the church and the leader of the meat hall is aligned with the church and that's going to allow you to have a better and more direct connection with them. Uh, whereas if you are opposed uh, in alignment, uh, then it, you might struggle a little bit uh, with that. Um, and of course, obviously neutral, you know, you're not aligned with either, you know, quote unquote side. Um, but, you know, you may find another neutral leader. You may not. Just depends. Cool. And then, really importantly, we have uh, weird, which yes. is a, that's an old English word. for like It's a, it's a person, and there's a very, ang, ang, I don't know, it's a very emblematic Anglo-Saxon, historical Anglo-Saxon. Let me just sidebar. Whenever we talk about Anglo-Saxons, we're talking about the historical people from what is now, you know, northern Germany, southern Denmark, who migrated into the British Isles. We're not talking about some weird, like, modern-day use wasp thing. It's not right. that. It's the actual historical Anglo-Saxons. Shouldn't have to explain that, but apparently I do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, weird is 
the Anglo-Saxon view of a person's sort of fate or doom or destiny, predestination, um, and hero. We consider that heroes have a super strong sense of weird. Right. Um, and just because it's radio, go ahead and sp- spell weird. W Y R D. There you go. Word, word, <laughs> weird. Yeah. Um, and and that is related to you know weird sisters and stuff like that. That is kind of you know the source of, well, at least the big source of the word weird, as in you know the modern word weird is a sort of supernatural kind of destiny thing. So right. yeah, and and yeah, so yeah, what does weird do? Uh, weird allows you to use something we call the alignment die. Um, when uh, you want to make, when you make a roll with advantage, you're going to roll two d20, right? Uh, so you're going to pick one of those to be your alignment die. So either the old gods, neutrality, or the church. Uh, and if you select that die to be the result of the roll, so you know, obviously, if you're rolling with advantage, you know, it's the highest die. Uh, or if you're rolling with disadvantage, the lowest die, then you are going to get inspiration. Uh, so it was fated to be that you're going to succeed or that you're going to uh, fail. Uh, and you can choose either die. Um, so that, you know, for example, you might roll with advantage and um, the other die is higher, but you feel like you really need inspiration. Uh, so you select your alignment die, possibly failing that roll. It was fated to be that you were going to fail, but you get inspiration that you'll be able to use later. Mm, yeah, and inspiration. Will you make good use of inspiration? a good good mechanic yeah alignment die is really cool excellent um you know, and just to speak to that a little bit th- this was where we ended up the alignment die was where we ended up after months and months of trying to figure out how to reflect the differences in that sort of doomed melancholic uh view of the world of the kind of old ways right. and a more sort of hopeful view of, of christianity in, in in the early church at least um, yeah, we ended up with the alignment die to just give you that bonus. It's very sort of heroic as well that you might choose to fail now in order to get a boost for later. That seems very um, in keeping with the setting, I think. Right. I like it a lot. And we did about a million different versions. <laughs> yeah. Of it used to be much, much more complicated and just was not going to work in a. Uh... I really liked it when it was really, right? It, as an idea, there was one point where you almost had a little table, didn't you? And it depended on your alignment when you were using rolling the two die when you had advantage yeah. or disadvantage. And, and there was a sort of, you know, you had to almost consult the chart to see what it meant. Right, yeah, we were considering it whether... it was nice, but it was never going to work at the table. Yeah, yeah it was one of those I things where it. we liked the... Uh, we were going to have symbols on the dice, and again, a D20, very small individual faces, was just not going to work. But, uh, but it was cool. It, just it was never... cool. We spent a lot of time on that thing that had to be thrown out. <laughs> right. But it was, it's one of those ones where it's a huge relief where, you, where yeah, because you came up with this implementation and you go, yeah, no, this, this does the thing we want it to do. Coming back to the sort of, the, the sort of theme we're trying to invoke is, is evoked by this mechanic, but it's not torturously complicated. Right. Um, for very little reward. Do you know what I mean? 5 e is nice and streamlined and it chugs along really fast. So yep. don't, you know, don't yep. ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. I can't remember what. Yeah. What's next? Followers. Yep. I've started. I talked during your bit, but I'll carry on with followers. Um. Yeah. Really, really important piece of five E technology we have invented is how we have dealt with followers. So because you have just a lone player, one one player playing their hero, um, within the setting, Beowulf has his crew and his the people that are with him, and and we reflect that with followers. Um, and they're a yeah, new kind of non-player character who are, I'm, I'm reading them from the book here, they are considered, <laughs> so this, this costs you £45 to listen to this because you're getting the best part. Um, they're, they're a new kind of non-player character who are considered to be in the company of the hero, unless otherwise directed or stated. And they, they have, they're a li- almost a little bit like spells, followers. When they can do something useful, each has a bunch of gifts, they might have some burdens, uh, they, uh, so they might help you sometimes they might hinder mostly help they're there to help you most of the time um, 
and when you when you want them to do stuff they just they just step onto the stage into the limelight do their thing and then they 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 drift back into the background afterwards right um yeah, you talk about followers too, Jacob, because you'll do this better than I will. <laughs> it's all good. Um, yeah, speaking of uh, torturous development, followers <laughs> took a little while to get right. Um, yeah, do you know what? I'm really proud of followers because it was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's been nice. People have been, you know, people that played the Hermit Sanctuary have been really excited about it, and I was really glad because I think it's good, but we paid for it in sweat. Right. Yes, <laughs> yes, we did. Um, but uh, like John says, they're basically inspired by the poem, of course, um, that you have a certain number of people that are with you. Um, they're kind of junior heroes. Um, they want to help out, uh, and each of them have a certain number of gifts, uh, and sometimes they do acquire burdens, uh, and they're going to step up when it's appropriate. Um, and we'll talk, we'll, you know, when we get to the follower section, we'll get in much more detail about how you use followers uh you know, in investigative scenes, social scenes, combat scenes, uh, they have ways uh, to you know, help out in each of those. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the, the uh, game process is that you will have followers. You may uh, earn or recruit followers during the course of an adventure. Uh, sometimes followers are going to want to leave for various reasons, or you may want to dismiss a follower so that you can possibly uh, take on somebody else. Um, and there you have a whole development process uh, that we'll get into. Uh, but yeah, they are there to help the hero. Again, if you are a solitary hero playing in a 5e game, you need a little bit of help with the action economy sometimes, and followers provide that. Awesome. Cool. Really good. Um, yeah, so the next thing, every hero, this is quite alarming to people who may have played more traditional D&D &D games, for example. Uh, every hero gets a ship. For free. Every hero, for free, you just have it because you're a hero, and you will always be able to get your hands on a replacement ship should you lose your ship. Because the whole thing is predicated on sailing around the Baltic and the North Sea and the archipelago of islands and places within that, uh, hunting down monsters and helping people. Um, so you need a ship to get from A to B. Um, it's a little bit like uh, you know, a horse in a, a different kind of fantasy game. Um, so everyone has a ship and it has a crew who... The crew are a bit different to followers. They very, very rarely come into the spotlight at all. And if they do come into the spotlight, it's kind of en masse. Um, like, for example, the crew may run away if you've beached your ship and you, you've gone off with your band of followers, your war band of followers, and you're deep into the you know, inland and, and some, somebody attacks your ship. The crew will probably just run away en masse. Right. Um, none of them will be killed, particularly, you know, they're, they're, they're very much a background detail. Uh, but they're like the engine that, that powers the ship from A to B. Uh, but you always have a ship and you always have a crew, um, right. which is really cool. And we have some rules for um, the different features of your ship, which we will get into in that section. Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll keep hearing gifts and burdens over and over again. Uh, that's another piece of technology that we developed along the way um, that we find uh, extremely useful. So yes, you can always get a ship if you lose your ship, but as you take on your your ship, uh, you're probably going to you know improve it in various ways uh, by basically buying gifts for the ship. You know, greater speed, uh, more benches so you can have a larger crew, uh, more supplies so you can go for a longer distance, um, that sort of stuff. Um, and then, of course, if that ship you know does meet its doom, uh, then the new ship doesn't have any of those things. Um, so um, that's something that uh, you'll want to watch out for and hopefully try to you know, keep your original ship. Um, so Cool. Now, just as an aside, I'm having some building work carried out outside, and I've just seen a really enormous pump be carried in. So <laughs> if there's a massive cacophony suddenly starts up, you'll know what it is, and we'll have to reconvene later. Right. I think it might be running now, actually, so I think we're all right. Well, we'll if, it is, if it is, I can't hear it. So that's good. Okay, good. Right, so yeah, the next thing is equipment and war gear. That's good that I'm talking about this. So I like like I've mentioned in, in other sections, I'm a bit of a sort of migration era, dark ages history nut. Um, and we have um, come up with some very era-specific and appropriate equipment and war gear. 
for Beowulf Age of Heroes, um, and we've added a whole bunch of new inherent properties uh, to weapons and equipment, uh, with the advantage of this being one player, one GM. It's less critical. You can no, More regular weapons can do more stuff because it's not holding up the group's play. You know how bad it is if you have to wait for another player to choose what they're going to do with a piece of quite mundane equipment. That gets a bit dull. Less important in duet play. Right. Um, so there are a few more tactical options. Um, shields and helmets are the primary change, really. They, they give you a much bigger boost to armor class, but there are a bunch of other weapons that have new properties that can circumvent those boosts, yep. um, which is really cool. Yep. Um, I think we did a pretty good job of... I think that was enough to bring that sort of Dark Age feel in there that, that you know, a helmet and a shield is a pretty good set of armor, if you like. You know, right. there's no plate armor. Obviously, it's not been invented yet. Um, there's various different kinds of mail we can get. Um, but, but a helmet and a shield are, are useful things, you know, right. um, just to make sense of the fact that a lot of people would be in battle with just a helmet and a shield. Exactly. Very good. Yep. And then, of course, also the other half of that is that... Um, and we'll talk about this more when we get to treasure. Yeah. There, yeah, there's some magic items in Beowulf and whatnot, but there's not. It's not like a, a traditional fantasy world, traditional D and D fantasy world, where you know there are magic shops where you go and buy your you know plus two plate armor or whatever. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Uh, and so, giving the shields and and helms uh, a little bit wider range. Uh, of things to you know of, of armor class, um, you know helps out with that a little bit in the system. Just keeping yeah, the, the, the numbers in the right range. The focus on the equipment is it's a narrower range of things to be appropriate to the setting, but there's a depth of choice. Right. Um, you know there are different types of shield within. You know, yeah. Within yeah. Cool. cool. Beowulf, Age of Heroes. And uh, speaking of weapons, shield, the spears are always available. Um, yeah, again, just like with ships, if you lose your ship, you can get a ship. If you lose your weapon, somebody has a spear that they can hand you. Uh, and that's one of those things that just, again, uh, that is the most common weapon of the era. Uh, and uh, we did a few things uh, to help encourage that um, in the game system. One of them being just, hey, you never have to pay for a spear. Cool. And again, another sort of artifact of duet play that since you're a singular player with a bunch of followers, yeah, someone will always hand the hero a spear at, the, at a vital moment. So they don't end up, you don't end up as a lone hero sort of disarmed, running around, <laughs> <laughs> sort of having your adventure ruined, not feeling particularly heroic. Right. Okay, so what we got next? Oh, there's another. So in the book, that, that's one spread that gives you all of this these new uh, the summary of these new things and then turning over the page there's another spread there's another Amazing. spread it's the last it's one cool though. stuff yeah yeah <laughs> it's not it's not too and it's, you know it's all good it's all good um so the next addition to the 5e rules and the setting is a thing called the portent now when beowulf sets out as i mentioned earlier he checks the omens before he makes his voyage um or perhaps the way the poem described it this is just entirely normal uh, function of migra migration era, ship travel, that you do a bit of consulting the omens. Um, so every Beowulf adventure begins with a sea voyage, and every sea voyage begins with checking the portent. Um, and we have a system that creates, randomly creates a little bit of Anglo-Saxon-ish poetry. Can't claim it to be too, you know, <laughs> it's not making perfect Anglo-Saxon poetry, but it creates an evocative set of couplets that relate to the upcoming adventure and how those are delivered to your hero could could be in any number of ways from a, a snatch of song overheard by the hero or a prophecy of the wise member of the ship's crew or perhaps the mutterings of a very grumpy member of the ship's crew um, the delivery as it says here in front of me can take many forms uh, the player rolls up the portent using a series of tables which have all these really cool evocative words on that you piece together into a couple of couplets and what this also does at the same time is stocks something called the inspiration pool. 
which Jacob is now going to talk about. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, the uh, the portent does multiple features, uh, but one of the things mm -hmm. that it does is the inspiration pool, uh, which is a really, really uh, neat system where we have basically three little sections uh, the, for the hero, the followers, and the monster. Um, so as you uh, write down the various uh, component words of the couplet, uh, you're going to take note of... Uh, Basically, on the chart, it's got different symbols and different colors. Uh, so, some of those represent the hero. So, every time that comes up, you put a, a uh, marker in the hero pool. Um, when the followers come up, you put a marker in the followers and one for the monster uh, if it comes up. Uh, during the game, you can remove one of those markers to give the appropriate individual inspiration. So, take one from the hero pool to give the hero inspiration if they need it, one from the followers pool to give a follower inspiration. Uh, and the GM can pull one from the monster pool to give the monster inspiration. Uh, and of course, we give the monsters very fun things to do with inspiration uh, in their, their monster stat blocks. Um, mm. Do you know, and we should probably save a bit of this chat for later, but I do want to talk a little bit about the inspiration pool. The monster pool allowing the GM to, to have inspiration for, for Monster, I think is really interesting because you can really use it as a GM to build a bit of tension as to when you're going to, if, if should the portent go against the player and be a sort of ill-fated omen, you might end up with a bunch of inspiration for the Monster. Now, if you're just a really super kind GM, you might pull those tokens out and use them earlier in the adventure but I think most people are more likely to just leave them there, which is racking up the tension about when they're going to be used. <laughs> and yep. you know they're going to be used in the final encounter with a big monster, you know. So it's really like it works really well. Yep. Almost if as the GM, you almost don't have to use it. To I mean, I'm not even some massive fan of adversarial GMing or anything like that. But it's a lovely ratchets up tension when there's tokens in that monster pool. It's great if there's because there's a total of four tokens that are, that are applied to these three pools, and it's really interesting how those fall in different ways, you know, because they're never going to be equally allotted. Right. Um, if there's a couple in the hero pool and a couple in the monster pool, of course, players don't want to pull their tokens. They want to leave them there to kind of, you know, counteract when the monsters... Right. It's interesting. Interesting little... Very simple, but it works really well. And again, we, we needed that for duet play because um, in the rules as written, fifth edition rules as written, you can give other players inspiration. If you have it, you can pass it to someone else. Right. Uh, and of course, you don't have that. You don't have anyone else. So we, we, we've got the... The uh, inspiration pool, but we added that little sting in the tail. And again, that's all melancholic northern poetry thing that that it doesn't all go the hero's way right it's pretty cool yeah sorry i'm just talking i'm not very disciplined am i will each take turns to do this so it's, all person. Good. it's all good <laughs> so uh... people that know me will be laughing <laughs> at me good suck right. it up Voyages is the other thing. Yeah, we've kind of really discussed voyages. So, oh, no, we haven't. Shut up, John. Um, <laughs> the other thing, I was thinking, oh, yeah, every adventure begins with sea voyage, right? That's it. No, no, this is a really important thing. So the portent, when the portent is created and it stocks the inspiration pool, it also does another thing. While the player is putting down the, the inspiration tokens and cheering or crying, the GM is writing down the results of the roles that, that stock that pool and then using them to basically create random encounters for the voyage now voyages again in in the poem it's over quite quickly but we wanted to give a little bit of sort of initial kind of flavor and, and a series of events that happen at sea to frame the adventure and kind of determine exactly how the hero you know whether he turns up in like beowulf does just in really you know in good grace just looking brilliant and everyone cheering or if they've had some problems en route that's a nice uh, addition to any adventure you know, it just spices it up a bit. Right. Um, but it's it's not a huge thing. Um, it, it's quite a quick section of every adventure, but it's a nice little frame. Right, yeah. and, yeah. then, and it's quite neat that it happens from the same role that makes the portent. Oh, something we should talk about, Inspiration Pool and the portent. If you want to draw out tokens from the Inspiration Pool, you need to link it in some way. What's going on in the game needs to in some way be linked to the to the portent. Right. Um, so the little bit of poetry that's been created, you've got to reference that to... to 
and it's quite easy. They're, it's very, you know, it's very vague and mystical. So it's quite easy to do, but it's a nice thing to have to do, I think. You know, and it it, it makes the portent true. Right. Like right. That. Yeah. 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 Whatever the portent ends up being, like John said, it's always big enough that you'll be able to find something or invent something uh, to you know connect it with. Um, but yeah, then you know it 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 all wraps in together. Yeah, nice, isn't it? That's good. That who thought that? Out? That's clever. Good. <laughs> well done. Well done, us. God, yeah. you're so good. <laughs> this is primarily you. John's idea. You can tell. <laughs> Was it? I don't. Honestly, I don't know. Was it? He says in a really like pro innocent way. <laughs> No, but it's interesting, again, as a total sidebar, it's really interesting working with a group of people where everyone is throwing ideas in right. and you do just completely lose it. Well, you couldn't have come up with an idea if the other people hadn't been talking about yeah. something else that was wrong That's, beforehand. That is true. It, yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm being a little unfair to you because I think, you know, inspiration was something that, again, we had identified an issue. I think you had the best solution to it. Uh, I think challenges was a little bit more me. But again, yeah, it, was, it was all it was, together, yeah. you know, again, yeah, um, absolutely. yeah that uh, everything came together in a really, really nice way. Beowulf, Age of Heroes. Hello, it's John again. Uh, just doing a bit of an outro. Thank you very much for tuning in. I think this was a really important episode, actually. This That really gives you the big rundown on, on everything that's in Beowulf, Age of Heroes in terms of system stuff. Um, and kind of setting dependent system stuff that we've we've added into the game. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and, and keep tuning in to hear more. We will be back next week with another section rundown. I hope you enjoyed it and don't forget to swing by handiwork.games where you can find all sorts of stuff out about Beowulf Age Appearance and our other games. Thank you. Bye for now.